Hi, this one is going to be a special episode in a different format about how you can overcome stress and anxiety in times of crisis. How can you deal with isolation in a productive, in a healthy way? How can you maintain healthy relationships and, and keep in touch with the people you love? See, in times of crisis, we are stunned by, by an avalanche of worrisome news and, and also fake news. And all of this may further increase our restlessness. So what can we do about it? So to answer all of this, I want to assure you that positive psychology has great guidelines that can help us to maintain good mental health and get out of the crisis better than when we entered. Now, what is crisis? Imagine the following scenario. You're living your life normally and then suddenly something completely unexpected happens. A disease begins to spread where you live or a natural catastrophe destroys much of your city or your country's financial system breaks down and you run out of money overnight. Now, in all these examples, how can you act in these cases? How can you stay calm and rational and mentally healthy in the face of serious moments of crisis? Many people believe themselves to be centered and calm and and prepared in theory, but when the crisis really comes, they end up not knowing exactly how to act in practice. However developed a person might be, they'll hardly be able to overcome a moment of serious crisis without any obstacles along the way. And in this special conversation today, we're going to be analyzing some strategies to minimize the problems, so then you know how to act in extremely delicate moments in the best possible way. It is important to clarify that during a crisis, the problem is real, and therefore it needs to be addressed. This clarification is important because when you're making a conscious effort to take care of your mental health, you might be misunderstood. If you decide to distance yourself a little bit from the overload of the bad news, some people might think that you're being alienated or reckless or that you don't care. If you take a few minutes in the morning to exercise or meditate or read a book, it may give the false impression that you're not taking the problem seriously or that you don't have compassion for all the victims of the tragedy. And this type of confusion can create so many problems. It is because you take the problem seriously that you must know how to take care of yourself, of your mental health, to draw a limit on the amount of news that you allow to enter in your life, to prioritize the minimum amount of well-being you need with physical exercises, with mental clarity, with good nutrition, with a productive day, with learning, with restful sleep. Only when you are strong and healthy, then you have the ability to face a crisis. And because of this, all the cares for yourself that we present in this special episode in no way mean that you're ignoring the real problems. You need to know how to face the problems in the best possible way within your reality. And for that, we will start by understanding the importance of taking care of your mental health during these times of crisis. Let's do an experiment to understand how your brain works. I'm going to ask you to join in an experiment right now. We're going to do this all together. Let's divide ourselves into two groups, depending on our year of birth. If the year of your birth is an even number, then please close your eyes right now. If your year of birth is an odd number, then you keep your eyes open. Ready? Okay, very well. Now let's do the opposite. Whomever was born in an odd year, please close your eyes. And those of you who were born in an even year, please keep your eyes open. Ready? Okay, ready well. Now everyone can keep your eyes open and take a look at this drawing that will appear quickly in our screen. Okay, now let's use the comments below the video to write whether you're part of the even or odd group and also write what you saw in the drawing. Pause the video now. Are you ready? Did you write it here? It's likely that a larger proportion of people who were born in even years interpreted the drawing as being a duck, and whoever was born in an odd year interpreted the drawing as being a rabbit, because these were the images, the previous images, that may have influenced your interpretation. Your mind can be a more serious problem than the crisis. This simple example of the optical illusion shows us how fantastic the human mind is can be our greatest ally, but it can also be our worst enemy. However big the crisis you're going through, the mind has the capacity to make everything even worse, depending on the way you interpret reality, and depending on the reference sources that might be influencing your head. One of the skills of our mind is the ability to anticipate problems. 
We imagine what can happen in the future and then we seek to act accordingly. And this is a very useful skill for our survival. The problem is that our mind may end up exaggerating. We may end up anticipating so many problems that the result is anxiety, nervousness and unnecessary agitation. In times of crisis, this is very common. It is difficult to think of anything else. We, we see and hear all day long news and comments about what is happening. We are in this constant state of alert and many people end up having trouble sleeping and that only makes the problem worse. And the solution to this case is not to remain alienated from what is happening, uh, staying well informed during an epidemic or flood or economic depression is essential for you to be making good decisions and minimizing damage. Trying to pretend that nothing is happening, that is a process of denial. It is escape from reality. And this denial can also bring more anxiety, more nervousness, in addition to causing several other problems for you and also for those around you. The way out is to turn your mind into your greatest ally. The way you react to events is under your control. Moments of crisis are absolutely beyond our control. There is no individual action that we can take to completely prevent a virus from spreading around the world, an earthquake to happen or an economic bubble to burst. The only thing that is under our control is the way we react to these events. Most people react impulsively, exaggerating emotions like fear or anger or even panic. And this is common and even natural at first. However, as soon as that initial shock passes, we need to be very careful that our mind does not turn the problem into something bigger than it really is. We need to accept reality and find a way to face the problem in the best possible way. And the first step in this is to replace the destructive thoughts that cause discomfort with useful, constructive examples and references and stories. At the same time that a crisis brings horrible events, it also generates positive stories. There are stories of people helping each other to overcome isolation and disease and hunger. Stories of people who dedicate time and energy and money to help other people to recover what they lost. Stories of creating solutions that before were unthinkable. And you can intentionally set aside some time in your day to find inspiring stories. And when you find examples of overcoming, whether in the current crisis or in similar situations from the past, you strengthen your hope and your psychological well-being. Our mind works very much based on stimulus and reaction. Stimulus and reaction. If you only feed your brain with bad things, your reactions will be bad. If you feed your brain with good stories, your actions will also be good. So be very careful with your sources of information. Follow one or two serious sources that bring useful information for you to get through the crisis, but don't follow sources that just do more harm than good. Take it one day at a time. In long-term crisis, experts begin to outline future scenarios and predictions of what may happen in a while. They count the number of people who will die, how much the investments will fall, and how long it will take for everything to be just the way it used to be before. This information is important for making some strategic decisions in the political and economic level. What you always have to ask yourself is whether or not this information is useful for you, for making your day-to-day -day decisions. One strategy that reduces your anxiety levels is to focus on the present moment and live one day at a time. And the best way to train your brain to focus on the present moment is to use meditation techniques. It is quite simple, I'll explain to you the minimum you need to understand so you can get started today. Meditation is a training in your control of attention. You know those moments when you're trying to study or to concentrate to read a book, but it's difficult. After a few minutes, you start thinking about other things to do. So this is a type of a situation, it's, it's difficult for you to keep track of your attention. You would like to dedicate your attention to your study, but it seems that your attention is just going elsewhere. So. What you can do, you can do attention training just by paying attention on your breathing. Use your breath consciously, trying to focus your attention exclusively on the air entering and leaving your nostrils. Eventually, your mind will start to think about other things, about how the crisis will unfold. And then as soon as you realize that your mind is no longer focused on your breathing, you can gently bring your attention back to the air entering and leaving your nostrils and that's it. 
You don't have to force yourself to not think. What you're going to be doing is just to train the ability to observe your thoughts and let those thoughts go away. Ideally, your mind should already be trained to do all of this before the crisis will happen. But it's never too late. You can start practicing meditation and presence and conscious breathing, all of that today. These are skills. So just like any other skill, you can improve little by little, day after day. And then every time you practice, you're going to be advancing. Acknowledge, accept and learn to deal with your emotions. The most common emotion to feel in times of crisis is fear. We almost always classify fear as a bad emotion, right? But the truth is that fear has a function of protecting ourselves in situations that would put our lives at risk. Fear is an evolutionary advantage in how human thinking works, because then we can become more aware of the dangers we can increase the likelihood of staying alive. The absence of fear is not a virtue, it is a vulnerability. Without fear, you would take reckless actions, like driving without a safety belt, you would be facing some angry animal, or expose yourself to unnecessary contamination, like in the middle of a pandemic. There is no use in trying to suppress or deny your fear. Instead of that, you can acknowledge that you are afraid, and you can accept that the crisis will really make other people afraid as well. So you don't deny the fear, but you learn to deal with it. Fear becomes a bad thing when it starts to arise in situations when you are not at risk. And once again, here we have our mind anticipating problems that today, right now, do not exist. Let me give you an example. If you are in the middle of a pandemic, it is natural for you to be afraid of getting sick. The problem of this fear getting out of control is when you make yourself suffer as if you would be already sick when you're not. The way out of this is the same one, is to focus on present moment. If you're not sick today, right now, what can you do? You can take precautions to decrease the chances of getting ill. You can wash your hands properly, for example. Now, if you have already fallen ill, you can take steps to heal as quickly as possible and also to not contaminate others. What you cannot do is to be suffering exaggeratedly, as if you already had a disease that you don't actually have. Many of our fears are based on traumatic situations that we go through, for example, the illness or death of a loved one, that can alter the relationship we have with, with our emotional world. This brings the fear that similar situations will happen again and again and again, even though there is not much logic behind that fear. The best way to manage your anxiety in this case is to listen to the message of your fear. This will require a pause, a reflection, a certain self-knowledge. You can look for a quiet place and start to wonder why you're feeling that fear. If there is any past trauma that might be influencing you if your reaction is not being exaggerated. You can even write your questions and answers down, because writing is a very good way to organize better your thoughts. Now at Arat Academy we have the happiness course in which we have activities using expressive writing that is proven by positive psychology to be a very good practice for your psychic well-being. Now, when fear is absolutely out of control, we have a situation that can be classified as panic, and panic is different. It is a fear that comes from all directions. It's, it's, it's everywhere without understanding why. Since it's something bigger, panic requires a different response with professional monitoring. Panic and other mental disorders need professional monitoring. If you would fall on the floor and break an arm, what would you do? Would you go to the internet to find ways to fix a broken arm? Or would you go to a hospital so you could find an orthopedic doctor to take care of your arm? Hmm. The answer seems quite obvious when we're dealing here with physical health problems. But when it comes to mental health, it seems that some people have the tendency to want to heal themselves or just pretend that there is nothing wrong. If your fear during the crisis is absolutely out of control, if it's causing you panic attacks, severe anxiety attacks, or even obsessive compulsive behaviors, do not try to solve it by yourself. Look for a mental health professional, like a psychologist or psychiatrist. Ask your, your friends or family to help you to find some professional. Admit to the world that, that you're experiencing a health problem that needs professional monitoring. Now, of course, you can use the internet to find more details about your condition. There is the whole collaboration between doctor and patient. The patient needs to be informed in order to be able to report the symptoms correctly and also to make conscious choices together with the health professional. This means that there is a collaboration for the treatment and the treatment is conducted on a case-by-case -case approach 
but the health professional who has the experience of having already helped so many other people. In crises that require social isolation, such as quarantines that are imposed during an epidemic, you can still consult with healthcare professionals remotely, you can use the internet, you can use the phone. Keep in touch with the people you love. During a serious crisis, practically everyone around you is affected. An epidemic affects everyone. A flood damages the entire city. A banking crisis leaves everyone without money. This means that everyone is experiencing similar problems. Now, if everyone is having similar problems, this is a very good opportunity for you to open up more to the people you love. You can share your feelings. You can say how much you love each other. Think of creative solutions for small, practical daily challenges. Cultivating good relationships is always a good idea, but it is even more valued in moments of crisis. You can call your relatives, you can call your friends, you can call people we haven't seen in a long time. And when you do that, first, offer help. Ask how they are doing what they need, how you can help. Then you can also share your emotions. If you need, you can clearly state that you need help without fear of exposing your vulnerability. And if you don't want to talk about the crisis anymore, you can try other topics. Remember positive stories from the past. Show gratitude for everything that you have been through together and comment on any interesting book or series or movie that you have seen. Video calls can be a very good way to reduce the feeling of isolation that a crisis causes. Today, it is possible to even put multiple people on the same call. You can have kind of a virtual meeting with your friends, with your family. All these shared activities will help a lot. You can arrange people uh, together to read a book or to watch a series together or even to follow an online course together. And then you can make periodic calls to comment on the last chapter of the book or the last episode or the last class. If you're one of the people who say that you don't have friends, you have no family members to talk to, you can offer yourself to work in groups of online volunteers who are available to chat with the elderly, the sick or all the people you need. In this type of action, while you are helping other people, you're also helping yourself by feeling yourself useful during the crisis. This can also be done with your neighbors. If you have more financial or physical or psychological conditions than other people, you can offer some help to, I don't know, buy groceries or keep their house in order or to carry some packages. The crisis can physically isolate you, but luckily now we are in the best technological moment in history so far to be keeping in touch, even though remotely. Taking actions like this, you create a kind of a community in which everyone helps each other creating bonds of friendship and solidarity in difficult times. This is how humanity overcame so many crises before, and this gives us a very good clue at what we have to be doing right now. Look for evidence of reality and reliable sources. When the crisis is really serious, it seems that everyone just talks about that thing. Many people seem to freak out and they even fall into scams, over-the-top alarmism and fake news. Social networks potentiate all of this, and if you're not careful, you may end up in a cycle of paranoia that will worsen what was already too serious. Therefore, you have to be very careful with the information that you're going to consume. You can first select very carefully the sources of information. You have to prioritize the sources with high credibility, scientific data, official communications. Look in these media for practical information, information that will really help you in your day-to-day -to, -day to overcome the crisis in the best possible way. Second, set aside one or two specific blocks of time of your day to be consuming this information. This is a very smart strategy because without doing that, you might end up spending the entire day seeking information about crisis here and there, and that might affect your mental health. Third, rethink your use of social media. Review the people you're following. Silence some words, mute the words that are making you feel unwell. Get out of the groups that are spreading fake news. Consider deleting your accounts. Don't think you're going to be uninformed without social media. The information must come from the sources that we're talking about here. Vehicles with high credibility, scientific data, official communications. If none of these are informing the cure for the disease, the catastrophe, the crisis, it's not going to be a random person on Twitter who's going to inform you. Look for facts, not rumors and misinformation. Don't be the amplifier of fake news. Don't share information without checking two or three times and only send to other people links from 
extremely reliable sources. Spending all day connected and consuming information is not going to make you necessarily better prepared to deal with the crisis. There is a limit of information that we can intelligently consume. Access will only unnecessarily increase your sense of risk, your nervousness. Instead of doing that, divide your time. Take some time to read, to talk to other people, to tidy up the house, to do some physical exercises. You cannot confuse the need to stay informed with being hyper alert. It is not necessary that you know absolutely everything about the crisis, that you read the opinion of all the experts, that you watch all the videos available about that subject. Too much information makes you always think of the worst case scenario. It will bring the impression of an imminent catastrophe that things will fall apart at any moment. And when we are anxious, nervous, worried about that way, our body produces adrenaline that can cause inflammation and induce a stress response in our body. Under the right circumstances, stress is an important, useful, evolutionary tool for staying alive. However, prolonged stress damages your immune system, making you more susceptible to disease. The problem is that it is difficult not to be stressed when we are constantly bombarded with scary information. So, Choose your sources of information very carefully. Set aside specific blocks of time in your day to read these sources and do other things later. Make isolation a learning period. In our ordinary day-to-day -day life, we're always complaining about the lack of time, right? We're always running here and there without time to be with the family, to have some time to clean the house, without time to learn new things. So if there is any small benefit during an isolation caused by a crisis, that could be it. Now you have the time to learn something that you always wanted to learn, to spend some time with your family, to do those small repairs at home. If you're going to be forced to go through a period of isolation without leaving your home, what are you going to be doing? Will you spend the entire day complaining, consuming negative information, getting more and more anxious? Or would you take the time to transform this isolation into something productive? Remember, you do not control the facts. You can only control how you react to the facts. The fact is isolation. The reaction is represented by the tasks that you will perform during that isolation. Ideally, these tasks are not merely passive. So please don't stay all day in front of the cell phone consuming news or spending too much time in front of the TV watching multiple episodes of your favorite series. To feel better, ideally, you should have active tasks that require mental and physical effort from you. This can include teaching something to your children, relatives, or even strangers over the internet. It includes learning a new skill that you can do at home, such as cooking, exercising with your own body weight, learning a new language. It includes tidying up your home, donating clothes, other goods to those who are in need learning to make small repairs in the pipes, the electricity, some carpentry work, create a new daily routine. Take the time to do the things you like, and then usually, because of lack of time, you don't do. Use these pleasurable activities as a way to emotionally regulate your fears and anxieties about what is happening. Remember to include physical activities in your routine. You can practice yoga, calisthenics, dance, stretching, any other activity that you can do at home with little or no equipment. The goal here is to maintain your fitness, to improve your immune system, to take care of your health in general. Taking care of your food, of course, is extremely important for all of this. Except that in crisis situations, your life will be different. There is no point in wanting to deny this. The best way you can do this is to keep your brain busy and challenged. Luckily, now you have access to the internet and a virtually endless world of useful knowledge. The challenge is to get out of the crisis better than you entered. Moments of crisis are always moments of great challenge. You can see people in pain, friends and family dying, your city being destroyed. If this is the reality, then the best thing you can do is to learn to adapt and deal with the reality in the best possible way. What you can do is to do your best to get out of the crisis better than you arrived. You're not going to be able individually to stop an epidemic, a natural catastrophe, or financial crisis only on your own. But during that time, you can become an even better person than you were before. 
This is the concept of anti-fragility, of strengthening yourself in face of difficult times. You can get out of this crisis by mastering the art of staying present, of practicing gratitude. You can learn new lessons, new skills, new languages. You can increase your connection with other human beings. This is a moment for you to be useful to your community. Perceive things from a new perspective. Suddenly, what you once considered to be a big problem, now you realize it's not so serious. So, does it really make a difference if you don't have a six pack? Is it, does it matter if you don't have a million followers on social media? What is the difference to, in your life to have a, the fanciest car or phone or electronic gadget? The crisis has the power to throw in our face the very few things that really matter. Our family, our friends, our health. If you have something to eat today, a house to take shelter in, especially loved ones, you already have just everything. Give thanks for that. And now, take the necessary practical steps to move on as best as you can. Crises are just terrible times. It is part of our human development to know how to deal with reality. It will be a mistake to suggest an escape from reality. It is a mistake to close our eyes and just use positive thinking and hope that everything will be fine overnight. But now you can strengthen yourself. And this strengthening begins with self-knowledge and the ability to deal well with reality. This is how you prevent your own mind from becoming an even bigger problem than the crisis itself. Positive psychology has already found a number of proven practices to elevate our emotional state. I want to invite you to access a special class on the happiness course. You can go and visit the link arata.se forward slash happiness.